Welcome to the Listen Up Podcast, where we explore hearing loss, communication, connections, and health. Hi, everybody. Dr. Mark Sims here. I'm the host of the Listen Up Podcast, where I feature top leaders in healthcare. This episode is brought to you by the Listen Up Hearing Centers. I help patients to effectively treat their hearing loss so that they can remain independent and connect better with friends and family. The reason I'm so passionate about hearing loss is I lost my brother, Robbie, twice. First, from his hearing loss, from radiation to his brain tumor, and then again when he passed away. I only care for ears. I'm the, e, uh, the ear of ear, nose, and throat. I performed over 10,000 surgeries and cared for many more patients with nerve hearing loss. I'm the founder of Listen Up Hearing Centers, and I'm also the author of a book of the same name, Listen Up, A Physician's Guide to Effectively Treating Your Hearing Loss. If you want to learn more about that, go to listenuphearing.com. Uh, today, I'm really excited about our guest. It's Sherry Eberts. She is a passionate hearing health advocate, and this is a great connection and somebody to talk to. She's an internationally recognized author and speaker on hearing loss. She's the founder of Living With Hearing Loss, a popular blog. If you want to go look at that, it's at www.livingwithhearingloss.com, which is an online community, community for people with hearing loss. She's also an executive producer of we Hear You, an award-winning documentary about the hearing loss experience. And she now has a book, Here and Beyond, Living Skillfully with Hearing Loss. It's the ultimate survival guide of living with hearing loss. You can learn more about that book at hearingheareandbeyond.com. She has an adult onset hearing loss, so it's a firsthand knowledge about this. And she hopes by sharing her story that she'll give others to be able to live more peacefully with their own hearing loss. This is great, a firsthand account of what it's like and somebody who's really gone to all sorts of media to talk about it. Sherry, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you for having me. Oh, you're welcome. So tell me a little bit about, I mean, you're in multiple media, right? You're in blogs, you're, you've got a documentary, you've got a book. You're, that's really prolific. And having done some of that stuff, I ad, admire just your tenacity to do all that stuff because it takes a lot of work to do it. H- how did you go from somebody who got diagnosed with hearing loss, what was that journey journey like for you? Well, it was a long road because when I first got diagnosed, I was in my mid-20s. But my journey really started many years before that, watching my father battle his own hearing loss issues. And he was tremendously stigmatized by his hearing loss. So he did everything that he could to hide it. He never asked for any help. He never asked for people to speak up or to repeat things. He just kind of bluffed his way through life. And so I watched that experience. And when I began having my hearing issues in my mid-20s, it was in business school. And so I started missing comments in you know some of these large classrooms. And I had really been hoping that it would skip my generation, but obviously no such luck. Right. And I went to get the hearing test and they said, you know, it's just mild hearing loss. So there's probably nothing you can really do about it. And that was the perfect excuse for me to just deny and hide and, you know, the typical seven to 10 years of denial. And so I did that. But um, eventually in my work, it was becoming an issue. And with friends who I couldn't hear well, I was avoiding them. And I just saw myself really following this path of shame and embarrassment that my father had sort of laid out for me. But I eventually did get the hearing aids and I would wear them. I would, you know, stick them in last minute before a meeting and then, you know, whip them out as quickly as I could afterwards. But once I had children, everything really changed. And I saw them watching me do the same things that I had seen my father do. And because my hearing loss is genetic, I always worried that I might have passed it on to them. Now, we won't know until they're adults as well. Um, But I didn't want to be continuing that pattern of shame and isolation. So I guess I did a 360 and I really went out there and started to accept my hearing loss. You hugged it. I hugged it. (laughs) I like that. And um, just decided that I was going to set a different tone. And so I started writing this blog, um, a little bit almost for therapy, you know, for myself to talk about my feelings about it, experiences and, you know, pump myself up for uh, different challenges. 
the um, the first post I wrote was around Thanksgiving. And it was, um, you know, before heading out to my in-laws for this sort of loud, exciting, family-filled Thanksgiving. And I just was worried that I would be marginalized or I wouldn't be able to participate. And so I put it out there and tried to think of, you know, suggestions for things I could do to make it a little bit better and put it out to the world. And I was just amazed at how many people were feeling the same way because yeah. of their hearing loss. And so that was like the catalyst. I felt so um, empowered by meeting other people with hearing loss and sharing my story and hearing their stories. So it started with the blog and then I just decided to try and spread that message as widely as I could. So I tried to write for more mainstream outlets. And then during the pandemic, it really just was such a challenging time for people with hearing loss. Yeah, with masks, it's just oh, very, very horrible. horrible. And isolation on top of the social isolation of hearing. Exactly. So we're like already isolated. And now here we are doubly isolated. And we can't even go out to the grocery store because we're terrified of what the person behind the checkout counter is saying. Say. We're not going to be able to respond. So um, we decided a group of advocates we decided to make a documentary about it. And so we did that. And then uh, my co-author, Gail Hannon, and I uh, decided to write a book about it as well. And so it's um, definitely been a great opportunity to just raise awareness about hearing loss and help people in the mainstream understand it better through the documentary. And then through the book, really, we hope helping people who have ear hearing loss live more skillfully with it. That's great. So what's the name of your book again? It's called Here and Beyond, Live Skillfully with Hearing Loss. And the website's hereandbeyond.com, correct? That's right. Thank so you. So people can go, and uh, we were talking about on the warm-up, they can pre-order it. It's not far off, though. It's about um, five or six weeks off to release. Yeah, May so 3rd. Yay! <laughs> it actually might be released by the time this gets published. So people should go and uh, order a copy. And so What's the structure of the book? In other words, uh, is it chapters by problem? Is it people's journeys? What, what, what is the style and the format of the book? Yeah, so we really try and lay out our, you know, formula almost for living skillfully with hearing loss. And so it's chapters on different skills. And then throughout it, Gail, Hannon, and I, we interweave our personal experiences about hearing loss to demonstrate some of the do's and also some of the don'ts, because obviously, um, you know, a life with hearing loss has its ups and downs. So we lay out the book really in terms of, you know, how do you live skillfully with hearing loss? So the first piece of that is really understanding the big picture, which is sort of the hearing loss journey. And I think a lot of people don't really understand that coming into it. I, I agree certainly. a thousand percent. Yeah. I don't know what they're getting themselves into or they don't even know what they're already into and don't even realize they're in it. A hundred percent. And that was exactly the case for me. And Gail had a different story, but the same thing. And we found that we went through a lot of the same stages. Um, but, you know, but if you don't know where you're going, it's hard to get there. So we really tried to give that big picture and sort of that roadmap for people. And then the second part is we talk about these three um, skills. We call them three legs of a stool because you know how a three-legged stool doesn't waver, you know, right. even if the ground is, is bumpy. Um, and we talk about those. The first is really about attitude change because a lot of people have very negative attitudes about their hearing loss. I mean, speaking from experience, I was so stigmatized. Right. about it, watching my father and just, and why, I don't know why it just, it's sort of a societal pressure that the person with hearing loss is sometimes the brunt of the joke, or maybe we just feel less strong or less in ourselves than we did beforehand. Well, I think society doesn't understand hearing loss. Um, I think there's not, it's interesting, you know, some people do better to wear hearing aids that are obvious because then people actually know you have a hearing loss. So the hidden hearing loss, I think, is very difficult. So people don't naturally think, oh, they have a hearing loss. They actually think they're not the sharpest tool in the shed. Right. And then they start treating you as being unintelligent because you cannot comprehend 
what they're saying. And I, I think that that's part of it. Um, you know, it's not like you lose a leg and you have an artificial leg or you're blind and you have dark sunglasses. I, but yes, and I think there is a stigma internally as well because people associate it with certain processes, if not in your case, but other people's case, the aging process and things like that. Right. No, absolutely. And I think it's it's just something that we have to overcome. You know, we have to accept the hearing loss and we have to feel like we deserve to hear and be heard and to learn to advocate for our needs because we do have needs and we need to ask for them. So that's sort of that first leg in terms of yeah. this attitude change. And we call that a mind shift. And then the second leg is technology. And so that's embracing hearing aids or cochlear implants, but also non-traditional technologies. So accessories, apps. I mean, if the pandemic taught us anything is that speech to text technology is advancing very rapidly. And that is life-changing for people with hearing loss. So this broad array of technology, also um, things like external communications and accommodations. So hearing loops, cart captioning. I mean, a lot of these things, people with hearing loss don't know anything about. I didn't know, I hadn't even heard of cart or a hearing loop until I went to my first HLAA convention, you know, many years ago at this point. But it's not something that we necessarily learn about from our hearing care professionals. And so we want to make sure that people are embracing all different types of technology. Yeah, I say, you know, as somebody who talks to people with hearing loss all day, yeah. you know, we almost need like a hearing loss university. I mean, there's so many topics with so many different things to get people, you know, I mean, you're at a very high level, right? I mean, getting people to understand that they actually have hearing loss can be a challenge, let alone you have hearing loss, you have well-fitted hearing aids, and you know that you can get your church to have a loop. <laughs> That's really, really uh, well on the journey in terms of acceptance and resolution. So. Absolutely. Although I feel like if technology, if these apps, you know, can almost convince people to embrace their hearing loss a little bit more, right? Because if you can go on a Zoom call and there are captions, then you'll go on another Zoom call sure. you'll, and you'll think, okay, I can ask for captioning at this other place. So I totally agree with you, but it's just those baby steps. And, you know, sometimes an app, is almost more, um, it's like an easier step for people. Less threatening, yeah. Yeah, less threatening than, okay, now I'm going to wear these hearing aids for the rest of my life on my ears. And you know what? You need, to, you need to do both, right? Most people need to do both. But however we get them there onto that part of the journey is, is fine with me. You know, let's right. just agree. Agree. Yeah. And then the third leg is sort of the non-technical piece. We call them communication game changers. And these are things like speech reading. They're things like identifying as a person with hearing loss. So, you know, I have my little hearing loss speech when I meet a new person or I go to a new uh, conference or whatever, because the more you put it out there and, and the more you practice that speech, it's easier every time to just self-identify. And then it takes the pressure off right. because if you didn't hear everything perfectly, it's not like you have to be embarrassed about that. I was like, well, I told you I wasn't going to hear everything perfectly. So could you please repeat that? Um, and we have this handy tool that we call HEAR, which is sort of a four little checklist that you can go through to improve any listening situation. So it's these three things together. It's the attitudes, it's the technology, and then these non-technical communication game changers that really build that skill set. Yeah, you make me recall. I had a patient many years. She's but she wear she had a pocket thing that said I have you know like a thing I have hearing loss, um, and you know it worked very well for her because you know she'd be like it disarmed everybody to already uh, accommodate her. Um, but she was far along her journey, I think you know because as you know, <clears throat> there's an underutilization or acknowledgement of hearing loss in and of itself, and so that's that's part of the problem. Absolutely, absolutely. And then in terms of the book, what we do is, so we have the journey is sort of the first part. And then these three-legged stool is of skills is the second part. And then the third part is really putting it all together and applying these to the most important parts of your life, right? So relationships, whether that's with your family, your friends, your work colleagues, all different aspects, because every relationship you have is impacted by your ability to communicate. 
and that is impacted by your hearing loss. So we go through various um, tips for all these different scenarios. And then we finally wrap it up sort of into a bow into something we called hearing hacks. And there are hacks for, you know, all different types of life hacks now. And there have always been hearing hacks. But I don't know if anyone's ever sort of put them into a book before. So we're kind of excited about that. But we have things for, you know, going to the theater, uh, going to a cocktail party, you know, hiking, all different types of activities, sort of a step-by-step um, set of tips that people can follow. So what are your top three hacks that you like? I mean, just, <laughs> you know, just out of. I, um, I personally love the hacks for the theater because I am a big theater goer. And so for me, when I started having my hearing loss and I was hiding it, um, it was just very depressing because it was something that I couldn't do anymore. So really, it's all about doing your research up front, finding out what type of accommodations are available at a theater, whether there's a loop, do they have an FM system, are you going to be able to use your T-coil with the loop, and then also now captioning system. So at least on Broadway, and I think also in um, London, and coming to probably other major cities, is something called Gallopro. And that is um, something that you can have an app for on your phone. And it's pre-populated with the script, basically. And you can sit there and you have captions with you, you know, on your phone, in your seat that don't bother anyone because they're not brightly lit. And you can enjoy theater that way. Yeah, it makes sense. There's not a lot of extemporaneous. I mean, if they're following the script, they, they should be able to. Right. You know, it's not like somebody goes off script in the middle of Hamilton or something. I mean, they're supposed to actually sing the songs as they occur. Does it, <laughs> does it pace correctly with them? Um... I mean, it's not perfect because it's driven by lighting cues and ah, sound cues. So it's got some so, sort of way to stay on on, exactly. on pace. Interesting. So it's not 100 percent perfect. But you know what? If it gets you, you know, 80 to 90 percent of the way there and, it, and you can also use that with something else. Right. So I could have my FM system and I could have the caption. So I as only... much data as you can get to your brain exactly. about what's going on so you can enjoy. It, right? exactly. exactly. All right. So that, that's a good one. What's what's your second most favorite? Oh, well, my second most favorite one is for outdoor activities. And so something like hiking, my family and I do a lot of hiking. And so making sure that you are in the right position in terms of the hikers so that people's voices are coming at you. I, I, it was You want to be in the front. You want to be uh, yeah, either in the front or second. I sometimes make my husband go first because I don't want to get the spider webs on me. Right, you know, right, right. Sort of break up all the good stuff. Yes. Right. <laughs> but making sure that you're uh, in the front so that people's voices are coming at you. Um, If you have a remote microphone and you have a large group, you could also give somebody, you know, a Roger pen or something like that so that the sound is correct. How about wider trails? Does that help? Wider trails definitely helps as well. And I think just walk shoulder to shoulder, right? Yeah. And setting a plan, right? So that, you know, if somebody gets separated, you know where you'll meet up. Um, and to stop and, and look at the view and have a conversation. And then maybe you change order so that you can spend time hiking with another member of your party. Right. So it's really about sort of setting that tone and setting the um, agenda up front is something that's really. Important. Yeah, it's kind of interesting as you're talking about that as some I have normal hearing, but I've done a lot of hiking. Uh, my son was very involved in Boy Scouts and stuff. And so even by the dynamic of the group, you you typically only end up speaking to perhaps the people who are one up or one below because right. the nature of, I mean, if you're on a more rigorous line hike, there's just not, you can't have conversation with somebody six behind you. Right, exactly. Okay. Well, good. Okay. And then what's the third? I'm just yeah. trying to get them all excited because then they can get yeah. the whole list of hacks from you. Yeah. Well, a third, another good one is for um, hearing health care. And not just hearing health care, but having hearing loss in a healthcare setting, like going to the hospital. So making sure that you prepare your kit for the hospital, because notoriously, you would think you're going to a situation where doctors will understand people with hearing loss, and they just do not. And with the masking, it's very, very challenging to communicate. So again, it's things like planning ahead, seeing if you can get accommodations making sure that you have apps on your phone that can help you to either um, ampl- you know, amplify better or speech to text. 
making sure you have signs that you bring with you that you can hang up around your hospital room if you're going to be staying overnight in the hospital because the shifts change all the time and it's hard to continually remind people I have hearing loss please speak up please speak slower Uh, so it's things like that again being prepared self-advocating having signs make sure you bring um, a container for your hearing aids because you're going to take them out to sleep people are going to come in they're going to clean and bye-bye to your hearing aids. So yeah, hearing aids are lost in the hospital all the time. Oh. I mean, <clears throat> so much so that the, the worst mindset is we'll have the spouse take them home so they won't lose them. It's like, how does that work? They can't communicate with you the whole time they're in the hospital, but people are unaware of that implication. 100%. You can even put them in a baggie and just use a pin yeah. and yeah. wear them. You know, when you're not wearing them in your ears, wear them on your body so that they don't get lost. But, yeah, yeah, no, that's it. That, that those are those are all great hacks and things that you know I've experienced, but haven't really sat down to think about in terms of uh, um, uh, putting it all together. Well, what's the next book? The next book, <laughs> we just finished this one. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, totally. But we would love, actually, we've talked about we would love to write a book for children with hearing loss because yeah. I think you know if you think of as an adult um, the isolation that you're going through yeah. and the challenges. For a child, there's probably a different um, set of those things, but making sure that they use those same stool, right? But just explain it in a way that's that's better um, and more understandable for a child. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd say that the profound difference, obviously, is self-advocacy as compared to parental taught self-advocacy, right? So your book is to motivate people with hearing loss to kind of teach themselves to advocate. And that in the pediatric population, you have to teach the parents to teach the child to sell because it does always come down to self-advocacy. I mean, unless you have one-on-one teaching, if you can't hear the teacher, the teacher is going to continue to go on absent you informing the teacher that you cannot. Hear. Right. So, yeah, well, I look forward to that book as well. Thank you. So, well, this is exciting. When, again, what's the, the name of the book? Hear and Beyond Live Skillfully with Hearing Loss. How big is it? Just out of curiosity. How big is it? How many pages? Oh, it's about 300 pages. Wow, that's, that's <laughs> but it's amount. very readable. We have um, we've made sure actually that there's a lot of white space. We tried to make it as accessible and reader friendly as possible, and it's and it's it, a reference in some ways, perhaps. In some ways, although I mean, you can read it from cover to cover right. because we do use a lot of humor in it and tell a lot of stories, personal stories of Gail's and mine. So it's not a dry read. You know, there's a lot of very, very useful information in there, but you'll laugh, you'll cry. It's it's actually woven together in a way that is easy to read. And we hope people will enjoy it in addition to learning something. Well, that's really wonderful that you're willing to share yourself in that respect, because, you know, it's it's not easy. Um, you know, it seems like you have hugged it. That's for sure. That's right. I love that. <laughs> well, I mean, I, you know, you got to go go take it. I mean, it's not going to change, right? I, I, I mean, you know, is your hearing loss progressive? Yes, it is. Okay. So, you know, and so that's part of really the journey as well, right? Is that, you know, that's what makes hearing loss a journey and not just changes. a puzzle, right? Because it changes. And so I have to accept that and I have to make adjustments. Maybe I need different devices five years from now than I needed five years ago. And technology is changing too. So I need to sort of stay up on what are the new things that can help. Yeah, it was interesting when, when you said um, uh, about hearing loss in healthcare. I mean, it just resonated a different idea with me. So one of the things, uh, you know, uh, when you're getting the technology, there are what I call sellers of hearing aids who just are kind of one and done. Here's your hearing aids. Come back and see me if you need me. And, you know, I would say to patients, like, it's a health problem. Health problems are monitored, right? I mean, you know, if, if, if your primary care doctor said, here's your blood pressure pill, take this, come back and see me if you need me, you'd look at them like they're crazy. And right. so that mindset shift that it's a, a continually monitored disease that needs continual measurement, monitoring, adjustment, you know, it's a continuum, right? I have a, patients who go through the full continuum of technological options for them because For them, that's what it is. And they always want to hear as best as possible. That's really the answer. Absolutely. And that's what I think is so exciting, really, about these new advances, like maybe the OTC hearing aids or these apps, because 
I think once you get used to hearing well in different situations, you expect that, right? You expect that and you demand it. And so if you're now not hearing as well as you used to, you're willing to take that extra step to get additional technology and additional technology. And so it really just puts you on that path of expecting and demanding to stay involved and not isolate yourself and use whatever tools you need to to do that. Yeah, I I hope you're right. I mean, you know, the only caveat I would say is people don't know what they're not hearing. And so, um, you know, self-assessment of hearing loss is very difficult. And the downside of the apps is they don't do discrimination scores. But I I agree with you. It's It's a great entry. Uh, to get into that area to really get the care that's, uh, you know, laser focused and different things work for different people. I agree on. Absolutely. And I think, you know, it's just getting started, right? Rather than do that seven to 10 years, if you could do maybe, you know, the first three years with an app and then you come faster to, uh, you know, more of a, a rich experience, you know, it's just getting people to care about their hearing, to take right. it seriously to realize it's not just about your hearing, it's about your overall health, your mental yeah. health, your physical health. I mean, you know that. Your and independence. A hundred percent. And so just getting people to start on the journey, I think is such a huge challenge. And so any way they can do it, I'm open to that. I agree a thousand percent, right? You know, get started and then figure out what the most optimal way, right? I mean, it's kind of, exercise, right? Just get moving, right? And then if there's a specific goals or you want to be better, then you can become a, a student of it and become better and better. So you, if you do, you're not going to get better if you don't move, right? Yeah. You're not going to get better if you don't do anything about your hearing loss. So this is great. So um, one of the questions I love to ask people is what's your favorite sound? Yeah, that is a good question. And my favorite sound is actually the sound of the ocean coming over rocks. There's this one beautiful beach Um, in the Virgin Islands in St. John that my family visits a lot. And it's a rocky beach. It's not a sandy beach. And so you can hear the waves coming in and out over the rocks. And uh, to me, that's just the most beautiful sound. And I can hear it so well with my hearing aid. It's like a high pitched sound. And I just love it. That is great. Well, we have Sherry Eberts here. She has a book coming out. It's Here and Beyond, Living Skillfully with Hearing Loss. If you want to learn more about it, you can go to hearingbeyond.com. Yeah, Sherry, is that the best way for people to get a hold of you or how can people get a hold of you if they want to interact with you? Yeah, absolutely. Either through hereandbeyond.com or livingwithhearingloss.com, which is my blog. And I'm also on Twitter as well at Sherry Eberts. How often do you pu- pu- publish blog posts? I try and do it weekly. Wow. Yeah. That's yeah. a great undertaking. Well, this has been great. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I look forward to uh, reading your book and learning more about it. Um, you know, I'm always, a, I'm really passionate about people doing well with it. So anything I can discern for me to help my patients uh, to hear better and be better connected to their friends and family and stay independent, I'm all for it. So I look forward to uh, getting a, a, my copy that I'm going to order when we're done and uh, going from there. Thank you so much. It was great oh, talking to you. Uh, yeah, thanks for coming on. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to the Listen Up podcast. We'll see you again next time and be sure to click subscribe to get updates on future episodes.